It is 3 a.m. in Israel right now, and along the Gaza borders, Israeli defense forces continue to gather right now, enforcing a total siege of the Strip in response to the surprise attack by the militant group Hamas. Now, Israel has mobilized more than 100,000 soldiers for war. So far, nearly 1,500 people have been killed in the bloody conflict that started this weekend. At least 900 people in Israel and nearly 700 in Gaza and the West Bank. And the fighting began early Saturday morning as Hamas gunmen attacked and infiltrated Israel by air using things like paragliders and land, blowing up parts of the border wall and attacking bases and rural communities, even a music festival there, killing civilians and kidnapping over 100 Israelis, now holding them hostage in Gaza. Meanwhile, Israeli retaliation has been swift and destructive with one of the most dense in one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, seeing barrages of airstrikes, buildings reduced to rubble, families pulling loved ones from the debris. Israeli government has called for a full siege of the city earlier today, cutting off electricity, food and fuel to that region. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressing the nation earlier today, saying that this is just the beginning. Any place from which Hamas operates will turn into rubble. What we will do to our enemy in the next few days will echo for generations. Now, the U.N. is calling for humanitarian aid to be sent to Gaza, with the Secretary General calling for an end to the vicious cycle of bloodshed. All of this as the situation is evolving rapidly on the ground. So let's get the latest from our very own Ellison Barber, who is in Tel Aviv right now. Ellison, uh, this is now heading into day three of fighting massive mobilization of Israelis getting ready for what looks like an all-out ground war, possibly. Any sense on what tomorrow is going to bring? That is the big question. And for a lot of people, the answer for them, at least in Tel Aviv, is uncertainty. That's what people say really fundamentally shifted this weekend on October 7th, which they're saying is a day for Israelis that feels a lot like 9-11. They say there was a life before that and then a life after that. And in Tel Aviv, a place that usually feels relatively safe, there can be an air raid siren here or there, but it's not uh, the same experience of, say, people who live in uh, the more southern part of Israel or people who live in occupied territories in Gaza or in the West Bank. They say they felt like they had a relatively normal life, but now that has changed. And there is this question of uncertainty of what happens next. There are reports in the last hour of a building in Gaza that housed a media type center space of that being struck. At the same time, there are reports of sirens, alerts going off, warning people of possible incoming missiles or mortars uh, in southern Israel. Israel. All of that is happening right now. But the big question of what people are looking ahead to after hearing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speak tonight is what is the next move for the Israeli military? And it appears like they are positioning themselves to be in a position to launch a ground assault in Gaza. Uh, we were speaking with people in Tel Aviv today, and one young person I talked to described themselves politically as a leftist in Israel, but said they feel like the country has been put in a position where they have no choice but to act to do something. And as he was talking about his views on things, his concerns about the hostages, his gut-wrenching pain over the massacre, the attack that they saw take place this week on civilians this weekend rather, and he said he feels that the only choice is for the Israeli military to move with force because there has to be some sort of dramatic response to this, he believes. As he talked about the idea of a ground assault, he said that because there are believed to be so many hostages, most of them civilians in Gaza right now, that that is what the country has to do to try to go and get them. He said he wished, as a civilian, as someone who identifies politically as left-leaning, supports a two-state solution, he wished there was a way that they could go in and just get the people who were involved in this and just get the Israelis out. But as we talk so much about just the dynamics of Gaza and the density and how many people are packed in there, he knows that that's unlikely and the civilian death toll will likely rise on both sides. And that's something that gives a lot of people fear and concern, maybe for different reasons on each side. But we always say this, Gotti, with war, ultimately what we're talking about are people and there are always civilians that feel the brunt of wars, always civilians who didn't ask to be put in these situations. And it's fearful. It's a fearful time for any civilian that's put in that position always.
Absolutely. And Ellison, we're watching so many videos come out of, of Gaza as well as Israel, and it's hard to tell what is uh, misinformation or possibly dated information. But when it comes to those hostages, uh, do we know how many are still alive? And, and, and what's the latest on that situation and the possibility of rescue? Yeah, so that's been a little tricky. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force, they put out some numbers saying that they were in contact with the families of 30 people that they believe or that they know, they say, are being held as hostages in Gaza. That being said, they said they were in contact with 30 families and they said they were aware of the numbers of people who were held hostage. But the numbers that we're getting uh, more broadly from Hamas and Islamic Jihad, the militant groups that are in Gaza, is they say that they have between 100 and 150 hostages collectively. The question today, the late news, was the idea that perhaps Egypt or Qatar could help negotiate some sort of exchange. The Israeli hostages for a couple dozen, a few dozen Palestinian prisoners and make that sort of switch. But as that discussion was happening, then there was a statement that came from Hamas saying that if Israel continues to launch airstrikes on Gaza near civilian areas without warning that they would begin executing hostages every hour. They also had reported through Hamas social media channels early in the, earlier in the day that four Israeli hostages had been killed in Gaza because of strikes from Israel. NBC News has not been able to independently verify that, and that's not something that Israeli forces have commented on just yet. But what we do know is there are dozens of hostages, many of them civilians, young children, women inside of Gaza, and families that are desperate for them to come out who are fearful not knowing if they are safe in there or if they will ever see them again. And Gadi, I know I'm rambling a little, but I will remind people there was a incident uh, back in 2006 where a young Israeli soldier, he was 19 at the time, was abducted by Hamas uh, outside at one of the border checkpoints, but technically in Israeli territory, and then taken into Gaza. That was a huge moment for this country. Ultimately, they ended up exchanging releasing about a thousand Palestinian prisoners to get that one soldier out and it took years he wasn't released until 2011 so this situation it brings back memories of that but on an even bigger scale and most of the people we've spoken to since we've been here that is their biggest concern is what happens to those people and how can Israel get them out and hopefully get them out alive Gotti important context there Ellison Barber thank you so much and, and please stay safe and on a night of breaking news right now, we have even more to tell you about. Turns out this weekend, President Joe Biden was interviewed in the special counsel investigation into classified documents. Now, Robert Hur, who is the special counsel in this case, is looking into how classified documents ended up at Biden's home and an office. A White House spokesman says the interview was totally voluntary and took place at the White House yesterday and Monday. The interview was reportedly arranged weeks ago, but ended up taking place as Biden was focused on fighting in the Middle East. And so let's take a quick step back here and get into how the current situation in the Middle East is unfolding. Somewhere around 6.30 a.m. local time on Saturday, air raid sirens started sounding across parts of Israel. Sirens that sounded like this. Israel is no stranger to sirens like that, but shortly after, some 2,000 rockets were fired towards central and southern Israel. Uh, you're seeing some of the aftermath of those attacks right there. And Hamas militants took responsibility from, for that attack, storming through fortified border areas, taking Israeli citizens hostage, and then taking them across to the Gaza border. We saw some horrific videos of those kidnappings playing out over social media. Uh, you can see one of them right there, disturbing to watch, uh, all while Hamas also killed some 260 people here in this part of southern Israel near the Gaza Strip, where thousands of people were celebrating at a music festival, with some reports saying that gunmen came paragliding into the fields nearby, taking hostages, opening fire on massive crowds, trying to run for their lives. Uh, you can see what the aftermath at that area looks like from above, cars burned, ca carnage all around. And shortly after, Israel launched retaliatory attacks into Gaza. Netanyahu coming on live television soon after, telling his country that Israel is at war.
כל אזרחי ישראל להישמע בקפדנות להנחיות הצבא, להנחיות פיקוד העורף. אנחנו במלחמה, ואנחנו ננצח בה. Now the government telling all Israelis to prepare enough food and water to stay in a safety shelter for at least 72 hours as the war is expected to escalate. Some reporting, especially this one from the Wall Street Journal, say Iran may have participated in plotting the attack on Israel over several weeks. Iran has officially denied involvement and the U.S. has not verified those claims yet, but a senior defense official did say that Iran is in the picture. And let's bring in NBC's Ali Velshi to help us explain and understand all of this. Ali, the, the coordination and the sophistication that we saw here, could Hamas have pulled this off without any outside support? It's not likely, Gotti. We don't know yet for sure. It's got hallmarks of things that the Iranians have done, and we know there's a relationship between Hamas and the Iranians. It's a financial relationship and an intelligence relationship and a, a, a training relationship. But it's just hard to understand how they, the, the, the Hamas uh, actors in this could have even trained for the things that they ended up doing. So it's, it's, there's a lot to be uh, unearthed here yet. It is not likely. It would be a big surprise. Surprise to everybody if somehow uh, Hamas had developed this level of sophistication and coordination for this attack. The intent, uh, I'm sure, is Hamas's, but it is not clear how they learned the techniques that they learned and how they brought it all together. Now, I will say we are getting some information that some of what they did, including possibly uh, jamming uh, cameras and things like that, that I normally look at them, was more low tech than we might think. But again, mm -hmm. Gaza is a very restricted place and Hamas is a very restricted operation. So it's It's a, it, we suspect that someone else was involved. It's pretty bizarre. It's the low-tech, high-impact asymmetry that we've seen in Ukraine, we've seen throughout the Middle East, but now seeing it in Gaza. Look, you've covered this uh, more than I think most people, and I really, really appreciate your insight. When you started seeing some of these videos, the weaponry that they were using, uh, the modes of attack, what really stood out to you? Well, first of all, uh, aerial stuff, the, 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 the paragliders. Uh, Gaza is a place that is com has no, uh, its airspace is not controlled by Hamas. It's controlled by Israel. And whenever, when I was in Gaza the last time, one of the common things, if you ask anybody who's been in Gaza, is you can always hear that hum of a drone uh, above. So uh, Ga uh, Israel watches everything Gaza does. So we're wondering, how, how does anybody practice that? Where would they have uh, learned how to do that? That was one of the things that was interesting. The cameras, the idea that they were able to, To jam cameras uh, again that's a level of sophistication because Gaza doesn't control its fuel its water its electricity or its internet that all is dealt with by Israel so those are the things that happen but it's got a, a the, the 9-11 ring to it God a lot of people talk about the impact that it has and the feeling people have here about feeling like 9-11 but bigger the, the, the 9-11 uh, part that that rings true here is is the coordination how this otherwise rudimentary group was able to to figure out all these ways of doing it. The, the toppling of offenses and things like that, that's brute force. That they could have done. Uh, but it did, it did stick, stri uh, strike me as odd that they were able to get all that done. The overcoming of the Iron Dome, that's an interesting one because earlier this evening we actually heard uh, eight interceptions of, uh, of incoming rockets by the, the, the missiles that intercept them. That was interesting because that was just, again, it was brute force. Hamas has typically sent uh, rockets into uh, Israel, sometimes the rockets don't even make it into Israel. Like, they don't get past the fence. It's very, very crude. But they sent so many of them. We've seen this happen in Ukraine, where Russia launches a lot of drones that are very cheap, but they, they flood the system. A Patriot missile launches. It'll get some of them, but it can't get all of them. That's what happened in, in, in Gaza. And back to Iran and, and any potential connection there. What is Iran saying about uh, its role? I mean, does it say that it was involved, or are they totally denying this? They're not saying they were involved. They, they certainly praised it. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, the Muslim world has sort of come down in different places on, on uh, how to deal with this thing. But Iran was unequivocal. They were a, a country that, that praised, not, not said that Israel was to blame or anything like that, actually said that this was a good act. But they have not acknowledged having a role in it. However, again, some of the techniques that were used, including snatching people uh, by people who are uh, the, the, the Hamas people who are riding motorcycles, if that's something 
that the Iranians have done before. So again, maybe they picked it up from videos or things like that, but it does seem that like there was some uh, Iranian involvement perhaps. Now, there's been some reporting in the Wall Street Journal that, uh, that there has been involvement by the Iranians and there was a meeting in Beirut to coordinate this. We have our own reporting in which a, 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 an official has told uh, Matt Bradley that that wasn't true. So we don't know what the, the answer is on that, but we will soon find out, I hope. And Ali, right now you're in Tel Aviv. I know that before this, a lot of the eyes were on the West Bank, uh, in particular what's going on in Jerusalem and, and uh, the temple, uh, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then you see what happens in Gaza. Yep. What's the situation in the north of Israel right now? And is it a, a statewide uh, high alert or are there particular hot spots? Well, the, the uh, civil defense of Israel has informed citizens to get rations to keep a few days worth of water and non-perishable food for fear that this will expand farther than isolated areas. Uh, Israel has called up 300,000 reservists. They don't even have 300,000 reservists, so they're, they're bringing people in who live in other countries but are part of the reserve. Over the border uh, is, is Hezbollah, the northern border. It's, it's, it's Lebanon, but Hezbollah, which is also Iranian-aligned, uh, operates out of there. They sent a few uh, rockets in on Saturday seemingly in support of Hamas, but not, not any kind of serious attack. Then today there was a small incursion. A few people went in. Israel has actually lost a commander uh, in, in the exchange with uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon today. So they're very worried that that could develop into something. Uh, Hezbollah has proven capability that is greater than what we typically thought Hamas would have. So what Israel is worried about right now is the West Bank, which is heating up again. There have been, I think, four shootings tonight at border crossings uh, in the West Bank, things heating up on the north and in the south. A three-front war is going to be very challenging, even for Israel, with all its military sophistication and might. Ali Velshi, thank you so much. Please stay safe out there. And now to the question being asked from Israel all across the globe. How does Hamas, a small militant group, take one of the most technologically advanced militaries on the planet by surprise? NBC News military analyst, retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitty joins us now. He was also the former deputy commander of the United States European Command. Uh, Lieutenant General Twitty, thank you so much for joining us. We keep seeing videos of some pretty... Uh, sophisticated yet low-cost, high-impact kind of tactics that Hamas seems to be bragging about uh, online, at least. Paragliders, the use of drones to possibly knock out sentry towers. But an attack at this scale, when you look at it, uh, what do you see from a counterintelligence perspective? Yeah, what I see is a very sophisticated, synchronized, well-planned attack. And when you take a look at those elements and the type of equipment that's used, there was some type, in my view, some outside influence here. And I know the intelligence community is working to figure that out. But we must remember that Hamas is a proxy of Iran. Hezbollah is a proxy of uh, Iran. We also have Palestinian terrorist groups on the West Bank. They're all proxies of uh, Iran as well. And when I say proxy, Iran uses uh, uh, these terrorist elements to conduct uh, business throughout the region, the Middle East, to take these destabilizing tactics. And they use these forces so they can deny, number one, that they were involved and also evade accountability for it. And that's what you're seeing here uh, with this operation that Hamas did uh, in the Israel. Now, when we're talking about sophistication, obviously a lot of coordination there, but also when you're looking at those videos, and again, it's tough to tell what's real and what's not, but in a lot of these videos, soldiers uh, and militants in particular, Hamas militants seem to be holding, like, M4 uh, weapons that look very much like American weapons. They're talking over walkie-talkies. Uh, they're kind of yelling. It, it, this is going up against uh, the infrastructure of, of Israel and one of the, the best intelligence-gathering countries on Earth. Uh, what went wrong here? Yeah, so what you're speaking of, you want to always have the element of surprise, especially when you're a weaker foe. In this case, 
the uh, Hamas had the elements of surprise. The intelligence apparatus broke down in, in Israel, and they just happened to have the element of surprise. So they were the ones that had the advantage here and the momentum. And now you can see that, uh, you know, it's a bit too late, but the Israelis now are starting to get the, a handle uh, and regroup from the element of surprise. They now have the border crossing seal. They now have put some stability down in the South. And now they can focus on the hostage situation while they're watching the northern belt border with he Hezbollah and also watching the, the western uh, West Bank. And so the elements of surprise caught them. And that is the reason why you see such devastation within the country. And now we're seeing a show of force from the Israeli military. What is a ground offensive going to look like over the next uh, two or three days if we see that materialize? Yes, um, I've been talking about this all day. And uh, my biggest concern is we want to make sure or the Israeli Israelis need to make sure that they really gather intelligence, both human and SIGIT intelligence, to try and figure out where the hostage are located. Hamas will try and decentralize these hostages. They'll move them about and so forth. And so intelligence for location will be the key. I do not see an operation where the Israelis will try to rush a full-mounted attack without having a full understanding of where the hostages are located. If so, they may rush to failure because, there, as you noted, there are 2 million people inside 140 square miles here, extremely dense. And so you want to sort of isolate where the uh, hostages are located and pinpoint them so you can just strike in that particular area instead of trying to take the 140 square kilometers. Uh, special operation forces will be key to try and insert them in uh, to try and figure out locations as well. But you don't want to get sucked in uh, with a military force, particularly an armored force, into a, mount, uh, a mounted environment, urban environment, and deal with IEDs, have to deal with tunnel complexes, have to deal with alleyways, have to deal with high-rise buildings where, where the enemy is shooting down on you. That would be a disaster that would cause a lot of casualties on both sides. Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gaddy. And we're going to stay right on top of this developing story all hour. What started as a music festival turned into a horrific scene. Next, we're going to take a deep look at the deadly Hamas attack and the kidnappings of innocent people at that festival. And one of the most horrific moments of the weekend in Israel came at the Supernova Music Festival, where nearly 260 people were killed during the invasion. Others are still missing. And NBC's Josh Letterman lays out what we know about what went down. And a quick warning. What you're about to see is disturbing. It was meant to be a night of free love and spirit, but turned into a morning of chaos and devastation. At the Supernova Music Festival, only about three miles from the Israel-Gaza border, young people flocked from around the world to the beauty of the Negev Desert. DJs played through the night and into the early morning. This video, taken by one of the organizers at 6.28 a.m., shows the sizable crowd still dancing carefree. Then, the celebration became a hunting ground for Hamas. As dawn broke, video taken by a festival goer appears to show objects approaching from the sky. They'd later find out they were Hamas paragliders. New video released by Hamas showing their militants training on the paragliders before the attack. Within minutes, festival security guards are seen urging people to flee. Video shows hundreds of people abandoning the party as gunshots ring out around them. Terror overwhelming this woman as she runs from the gunfire. In another video, people are seen hiding from attackers in the bushes nearby. 
amid the gunfire, a group taking cover and desperate attempts to save lives, tying a tourniquet around a bloodied leg. This dash cam video found by Israeli first responders showing a person lying on the ground being executed at point-blank range. Witnesses described abandoning their cars after being shot at and running. More videos showing crowds of people racing across dusty fields, trying to find safety. But some didn't find it. Instead, taken hostage. 25-year-old Noah Argamani seen on the back of a motorcycle as she's taken, presumably, to Gaza. Her family now pleading for mercy in media interviews. One witness, who says she escaped by foot before being picked up by a motorcycle, saw people being killed all around her. All the way people were dying, all the way on the road. Young people. It's a festival for young people. Many, many people were dying in the road. About 260 people were killed at the event, according to Zaka, an Israeli emergency response group. Videos taken the next day show the scale of destruction. Cars littering the road, burnt out at the access point to the festival as Israelis assess the human loss and continue to seek those kidnapped or missing. Unbelievable images. Josh Letterman, thanks so much. And tonight, continuing concern for the hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza, including some who were taken from that music festival. NBC's Richard Engel has the latest details. Families across Israel tonight are facing the worst possible anguish, with loved ones held hostage by Hamas and dragged into Gaza. Among the missing is Romy Gonin, a 23-year-old waitress who enjoys travel and is from a close family. This was her last birthday before Romy went to that doomed music festival. Romy was going to a party. Her mother, Mariv, first heard from Romy by phone as rockets started falling on Saturday, which was not that unusual for Israel. She's calling me, Mommy, what should I do? Tell me what to do. If no, no worries, the bombing will stop in a minute. Just be relaxed, go to your car. And... But this attack kept going. She was terrified. She was saying, Mommy, we are trying to get out of here, but I'm, I'm bleeding. We were shot. Everybody here was shot. And she said, Mommy, I'm afraid I will die. And I said, no, you are not going to die. Then she heard voices in Arabic. And then I heard shooting all around very close to the car and started hearing uh, voices in Arabic talking to each other, shouting at each other. And I was so afraid. I was so afraid. After that, the phone went dead. Alive. The family later tracked it to inside Gaza. Earlier today, we drove to the town of Zderot near Gaza, close to where the music festival was held. Major Jerome Spellman, an Israeli military spokesman, described the Hamas so killing spree power. here. Start shooting all these vehicles, stand, people standing at the bus stop, every single thing you see, carnage everywhere, dead bodies. Then came a barrage of rockets from Gaza. Quite close. Oh. Get in. Uh, Everybody in? This is what we're up against. This is like a shooter situation in the U.S. Imagine a thousand shooter situations happening constantly. You think we're clear? We are. As we left for another part of Zderot, Israeli troops seemed tense. It turned out with good reason. They are coming in very close. No one on our team was injured. Tonight, Mirav and her family are trying to hold themselves together. But as they looked at photos of Romy and reminisced, her sister Daria was overwhelmed. When you hear the sound of pure grief, it never leaves you. It's raw and primal. Tonight, it's all over Israel. Richard Engel and stood up Israel tonight. Thank you so much and stay safe. And joining us now is Bob Bayer. He is a former CIA operative. Uh, Bob, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. As things stand right now, do you have any hope for the hostages that are being held in Gaza? You want the truth? No. Yeah. 
I think that Netanyahu is going to have to go in, uh, reoccupy Gaza, which will involve fighting street to street, um, knocking down a lot of buildings. And the Islamic State today is not it is essentially in control of Gaza. Hamas has transformed over these years, since I used to deal with them, into a genocidal movement. We saw that at the concert. We can expect more of that. And if Hamas said they're going to execute hostages for every building hit, I think they will. I think uh, Israel is in a terrible position. It can't let this go. But they know to go into Gaza, it's going to go in with artillery and airplanes. A lot of those buildings are going to come down. A lot of hostages are going to die, probably by execution or otherwise. And some of those executions have been promised to have happened on, on broadcast and uh, live, adding an entirely different element to all of this in this new information age. I, I got to ask, though, it's not just Israeli hostages. We understand that there may be American hostages as well. We also know that there's a carrier group that is inbound uh, special forces in the area. How does the United States get involved, if at all? And is there a chance for special forces groups inserting themselves, removing some hostages, and then being able to be extracted safely? No, not, it's not possible. Um, to go into these buildings, you have to control the airspace. You have to control the neighborhoods. Uh, you have to go in what's called a combat entry. You shoot everything that moves. Um, it, it just, the, the, the Delta Force, the SEALs do not know this terrain. This is not Afghanistan, it's not Iraq. Uh, we don't have enough troops. Uh, the Israelis themselves don't know these areas well enough. I mean, the head of the military wing has been hiding in Gaza for, for, uh, for more than a decade, and they don't know where he is. They've been trying to assassinate him. So the intelligence isn't good enough for us. It's not good enough for the Israelis. Um, you know, this is really, truly a desperate situation. But what really worries me is Hamas itself and the other Palestinians who have become such zealots over the years. They didn't used to be this way. Like I said, I used to go to Gaza. I'd sit down with Hamas, the military people. I sat down with Hamas in Beirut. Uh, they knew I was ex-CIA. They'd want to exchange views. But I'd never go back now and talk to these people because they've adopted the ideology of the Islamic State. Now, when it comes to trying to figure out what Hamas's overall play here was, is it the hostages? Is it this protracted kind of hold that they now have over Israel from this position of kind of the lower ground? Or is it something bigger? It's something bigger. I think they would like to do, they, the Palestinians for years have wanted to do this is start a general conflict in the Middle East. They would like to bring down the Jordanian kingdom. Uh, Jordan is majority Palestinians. They would like to pull Hezbollah into this fight. Hezbollah so far has declined to enter it, but that doesn't mean it won't tomorrow. Uh, they're hoping for an escalation, bringing in Syria, and even Egypt, which has a lot of sympathy on the street for Hamas. A lot of the members of Hamas are actually of, of Egyptian heritage. So, you know, it, it's probably a bridge too far for them, but these people are on a suicidal mission. We saw that the attacks on Israel, those lot of those militants that went across the border knew they wouldn't make it back. But that's what's happened to Hamas at this point. Bob Baer with a very sobering insight there. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. And there's still more to come this hour on the dangerous situation in the Middle East, a situation that didn't start this weekend. These tensions go way, way back. And here's a, a quick report from NBC News back in, two, in 1987, marking the 20-year anniversary of the Six-Day War. This has been a bloody battleground over the centuries. Do you think it will come to that again in the streets of Jerusalem? I think it's very likely. I think that uh, for as long as... There's no resolution to, the, to our conflict. And we go on along the same path of further occupation. I think it's very likely that uh, there'll be more and more bloody confrontation between our two peoples.
And as the death toll climbs to the fighting between Israel and Palestine, so does the number of people missing, leaving so many families in limbo. And among them is an 85-year-old woman whose granddaughter says she was abducted by Hamas. Alistair Bunkall with our colleagues at Sky News has more. An amazing woman, an amazing grandmother. She, she's a very positive, very funny woman. She likes to enjoy her life. She likes to uh, help us enjoy our life, to cuddle us, to um, take care of us. Um, and, uh, you know, in the video, uh, you see her very, uh, like, very strong. That video of her in a golf cart went around the world. It was seen all over the world. It was shocking to those of us who don't know your grandmother, have never met your grandmother, to see an elderly lady in a golf cart. Uh, how did it make you feel? I, I don't know if there's any word that can describe. Uh, we, were, we were shocked. It hurts in every inch of our bodies. Uh, we're very scared for her. Um, she's ill, and of course she doesn't have her medicine with her, and we don't even know if she... how long can she survive without her medicine? And what we do know is that uh, without her medicine, she's in a lot, a lot of pain. So hopefully she's alive, but she's suffering every minute. And uh, we are, we are, we're shocked. We're hurt. We're scared for her. What would your message to Hamas be? <sighs> That's not human. Whatever they've done. Um, innocent people living their lives and they need to come back home you know um, the situation might be hard but there's no no reason in the world uh, that elderly and women and kids and babies uh, get kidnapped there's no reason and bring them back home whatever you do just bring them back home Alistair Bunkal, thank you so much. And tonight, vigils, rallies, and protests are being held all across the country in support of both Israel and Palestine. We're going to take you live to a pro-Israel rally in a moment. But first, here's what NBC's Maggie Vespa heard at a pro-Palestinian demonstration earlier today. It doesn't make it okay that c civilians are being harmed, but we have been the civilians that have been, have been harmed for over 80 years now. And it has built up to this point where people are somewhat happy that our frustrations are, you know, being released. And here in L.A., NBC's Liz Kreutz is at the Stand Up Against Terror Stand with Israel rally organized by the Israeli-American Council. She joins us now. Uh, Liz, what are you seeing? What are you hearing out there? Hey, Gotti, there's a massive crowd here in Beverly Hills. This is where we are at this park in the heart of Los Angeles. Hundreds of people have turned out. And it's actually quite moving to see the number of people that are here waving Israeli flags. Uh, People and cars are coming by and honking. People are also holding signs that show images of the children, the women, the elderly that have been believed to be killed or kidnapped. Up the hill here, and you can just see how many people there are. There's a, an event getting underway with speakers. They're singing the Israeli national anthem. And we've been talking to people. You can, I'll let you listen in for a moment. They're singing the national anthem, and we were talking with people here about why they came out, and I met an Israeli woman who her flight back to Israel got canceled, so instead she came here, and she told me the emotions, what she's dealing with right now, and what it means to her to see a turnout like this in support of Israel. Take a listen. I'm sad. I feel very sad. I worried. So for me, it's very moving to be here in the United States, that there is space, public space, that there are actually reporters that are interested to come here 
and and show the Jews in Israel that we see you, we see what you are going through. It's bringing you to tears. Yeah. It hurts me very much, and I'm worried. I'm also worried about what's what's what about to happen. And again, it, rallies like this are happening across the country right now. I know getting underway in Washington, up in Seattle, there's a rally like this too. And as you mentioned, Gadi, we're seeing rallies also in support of the people of, Pal uh, of the Palestinian people. And so uh, uh, dueling rallies across the country right now. But here in Beverly Hills, you can just see this massive and growing turnout of people here supporting the people of Israel. And Liz, I hate to even ask, but this is the day that we live in. Uh, I see big crowds of people here in the United States with these high tensions. Also comes security concerns, especially at synagogues and, and mosques and, and demonstrations like that. What do we know about the threat level here, possibly in the United States? It, it looks like we've lost audio there with Liz. We'll check back with her in just a bit. NBC's Liz Kreutz, thank you so much. And there's plenty more to get to this hour on the situation in the Middle East. Next, a report from the White House as the president confirms 11 Americans died in Israel, plus a closer look at the militant group Hamas, including their history of violence and suicide bombings in Israel. The explosion ripped through the commuter bus bound from Haifa to Jerusalem early this morning. Its rooftop peeled back with a suicide bomber had taken a seat in the front of the crowded bus. Within hours, the Islamic militant group Hamas had claimed responsibility. And right now, the White House is saying at least 11 Americans have been killed in the attacks in Israel, while a number of other Americans there are missing, and some of them might have been taken hostage. And joining us now is NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Monica, what do we know about, or Aaron, sorry, Aaron Gilchrist, uh, what do we know about the Americans both killed and missing, and what about any efforts to get any Americans uh, back home safely? Yeah, Gotti, that uh, really has been a key question, a key point of concern for the Biden administration, really from the very beginning of this, since they learned about the Hamas attack in Israel early Saturday morning. And, and as you just noted, we know that 11 Americans have been killed, at least. That information coming from President Biden himself in a statement that was released by the White House earlier today. Those 11 Americans, among the 700-plus Israelis who have also been killed in the attacks there uh, since Saturday. Now, the president also noted that many of of the Americans, those 11, uh, made Israel a second home in so many cases. He said, of course, that the safety of Americans is a top priority for the administration and that he believes that there are Americans who are among the hostages being held by Hamas uh, in Gaza right now. We heard just uh, the la in this hour from the spokesperson for the National Security Council. He was on MSNBC. I want to hear what you, hear, want you to hear what he had to say about the issue of hostages. There are a number of uh, Americans who are unaccounted for. We don't know if they're just lost or missing uh, or, or, or even hurt. And we certainly don't know if they're being held hostage, but that is a concern right now. Now, as far as the Americans who died, we don't have a lot of details about those individuals at this point, Gotti. We know the State Department has been trying to communicate with families, trying to make sure that they have information that they need and that they're able to get whatever information those families may be able to share with the government as they continue working to identify uh, just how large the American footprint is in Israel now uh, as this, uh, this war now continues uh, in Israel and Gaza. Gotti? NBC's Aaron Gilchrist. Thanks so much. And now to Israel's northern border and Lebanon. We've been talking a lot about what's been happening down in Gaza and the Hamas militants that carried out that weekend's uh, attack. But at the Lebanese border, we are seeing clashes with another enemy known as Hezbollah. Now, you might hear those names together sometimes, but Hamas and Hezbollah are different organizations. Both are political parties with militant wings that regularly fight against Israel, and both are backed by Iran. But while Hamas governs the Palestinian territory, the Gaza Strip, Hezbollah is in southern Lebanon. And over the weekend, Hezbollah also opened fire at Israel. NBC's Matt Bradley is in Lebanon's capital of Beirut with the latest. 
Yeah, Gadi, I mean, among those militant groups that are so opposed to Israel, the two most important are Hamas and Hezbollah. And I'm here in Lebanon, and just not so far from where I'm standing now is sort of the home territory of Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. And, you know, this is an organization that's a political party, a militant group that is also backed by Iran, and that makes them quite similar to Hamas, but geographically, they're distinct. And so far, they haven't really weighed in into the fighting in any real way. We've seen some cross-border skirmishes and attacks, missile strikes by the Israelis, artillery fire, and actually Hezbollah have said that they've lost three of their fighters so far, uh, but, you know, this hasn't escalated. So, in a way, you could kind of file this under something that's remarkable for what isn't remarkable. You know, both of these sides, Israel and Hezbollah, haven't escalated beyond the usual kind of fighting. And I, I hate to say that human death and fighting is usual, but this is the kind of thing that we see uh, between these two countries, between Hezbollah and Lebanon and Israel. And, you know, they haven't really shown that either side are willing to enter into a full-scale war. The last time that happened was nearly 20 years ago, back in 2006. But here's the thing. Both sides are backed by Iran, Hamas and Hezbollah. So a lot of Middle East watchers are worried that Hezbollah, taking directions from Iran, might push themselves into the conflict. That would be bad news for just about everybody because it would internationalize this conflict and it would drag in a whole nother country. This one, Lebanon, which has been fatigued by decades of conflict and war, both internally and with Israel. Now, there was some reporting in the Wall Street Journal recently that said that Iran has been directing this whole effort by Hamas, and that Iran could also push Hezbollah to enter as well, and that a lot of the planning was done right here in Lebanon's capital of Beirut. I spoke with a top Hamas official just a little while ago, and he told me that no, that report and all of the reports saying that Iran was behind this are not true, that this was 100% Palestinian and done by Hamas. Here's what he told me. It was a surprise to everyone, including Iran, which did not know about the zero hour. We did not inform them about the zero hour, so the timing was determined by Hamas. It was a completely Palestinian operation for the sake of Palestine, for the sake of defending Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa, and for the sake of freeing prisoners. But Gadi, regardless of who you believe here, this is a very, very dangerous situation. Even though the fighting here in Lebanon hasn't nearly reached the scale of what we're seeing in Gaza and Israel, it has the potential to internationalize the conflict if it escalates. So while we have seen death and we have seen attacks and fighting, we haven't seen the kind of full-scale war that would drag the entire region into a war. Gadi? NBC's Matt Bradley with a perspective from Beirut. Thanks so much. And complicated is an understatement. When it comes to the decades-long conflict in the Middle East, next, we're going to take you back to the beginning to understand how we got to this point. But Israelis fear a Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza would be a staging ground for PLO attacks against Israel. A leading Palestinian journalist doubts that. Grudgingly. We have come around to the realization that the Israelis are there, that Israel is going to stay as a state. We have made the compromise and we are willing to partition the land. And in the crowded refugee camps scattered around the Middle East, Palestinians wait for that homeland. They will negotiate for it or they say they will fight for it. And tonight, as we look towards an uncertain future, it is impossible to know where things are headed without looking back at the past. And for the Gaza Strip, conflict is ingrained in its history, going back generations beyond the days of the Ottoman Empire to British rule from 1918 to Egypt in 1948. And remember that year, because around that same time, as Gaza came under Egyptian rule, Israel was proclaiming statehood. And for 20 years, tension grew until an all-out war broke between Israel and its Arab neighbors. After the Six-Day War in 1967, Gaza was seized by Israel. A strong fortified position. To take it, the infantry were closely supported by air power. And then there is the odd case of violent history repeating itself almost 50 days to the day from this weekend's surprise attack invading forces from Egypt and Syria caught Israel off guard in what's known as the Yom Kippur War. During the fire mission, Syrian MiGs attacked. 
They came in low, their cannons blazing. The troops here fired back with machine guns and small arms. Israeli Phantom jets intercepted. The sky was a confusion of warplanes. The MiGs dodging, the Phantoms maneuvering for a position to launch missiles. Meanwhile, in Gaza, outrage over Israeli occupation grew in the first intifada, meaning rebellion began, followed by the second after a breakdown in talks for peace. Hamas, a Palestinian militant group, came to uh, Gaza in 2016, uh, 2006. That's when they came into power in the last election there to date. And although Israel seemingly gave up control of the Gaza Strip in 2007 internally, it instituted a land and sea blockade of that small small strip the size of Washington, D.C., arguing it was protecting the Israeli state. Now, a year later, intense fighting broke out once again. About 80 Israeli warplanes dropped 100 bombs on Gaza today. The Air Force released this cockpit video. More than 220 Palestinians killed, hundreds wounded, many critically. It isn't clear yet how many civilians are among the casualties. No time for ambulances. The wounded were carried on corrugated iron in private cars. Militiamen fired rockets at Israeli towns. Israelis ran for cover throughout the day and were told to stay close to home. But one rocket scored a direct hit, killing an Israeli man in the small town of Netivot. And since then, Gaza's unemployment rate is now among the highest in the world. Around 95% of the population does not have access to clean water. Electricity is limited. Food is often scarce. And the U.N. estimates that 80% of the population must rely on international aid to survive. Options to leave are also nearly impossible for those who live there. And nearly half of the people who live in Gaza are children. Tonight, Gaza is surrounded by the Israeli Defense Forces and under total siege, meaning Gaza would receive no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. And Israel says the siege is in retaliation for that surprise attack by Hamas fighters. And a top Hamas commander says his forces attacked Israel in part because of a recent Israeli raid around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of the holiest sites in Islam. And right now, as both sides look at the conflict, they are met with images like this. Death fear, destruction, and hate. And that's where we leave it tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, more on this unfolding crisis in Israel continuing right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.